Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, and welcome to the first session in the Grand Hall um, at the Shameless Festival. Um, we're really excited about today. Uh, it's, for me, it's kind of the first time in a year and a half I've been in a large gathering of people to talk about things, and particularly about this issue. So I hope you're excited as well. And we have a great panel with us today to talk about a very important issue, which is everyday sexual violence and what we can do about it. Um, I'm going to start with a few housekeeping rules. Um, we are quite strict about no photography or filming in this particular session. Um, there will be a professional photographer kind of roaming around this, the room, but that person's only going to be taking photographs of the panelists. Um, we do encourage social media, so hashtag shameless festival is the hashtag um, for the festival overall. And then if you want to tag any of our panelists on Twitter, um, it is at triple cripples for Jamoke, at Paisy Malika for Paisy, at Everyday Sexism for Laura, and at Winnie Emily. And also, you'll probably find those Twitter handles being circulated on Twitter as well if you follow hashtag Shameless Festival. Um, and obviously, we realize. Um, we are going to be talking about quite difficult topics um, throughout the day and in this session, um, so I guess I should provide an obligatory trigger warning. But then as well, if you feel like you need to step out or you need to speak to anyone, um, we won't be offended if you step out of the session. Um, and there are um, therapists and counselors you can speak to at the Survivors Trust, I think, in this hall and also in the marketplace. So there is pastoral care for you um, if, if you do want to speak to somebody. Um, and I think because we are running a little bit late, um, we're going to aim to finish the session at hopefully 11.45. Um, there will be no Q&A for this session, um, so I hope that's okay. But obviously, there's a conversation happening on social media as well. And I think we're all relatively approachable people afterwards. You can speak to us as well if you want. Um, okay, so everyday sexual violence and what we can do about it. Um, well, we're really excited to have with us um, a very experienced panel of activists and authors um, with us. Um, to my left, we have Jamoke Abdullah, Abdullah, Jamoke Abdullah um, who founded the Triple Cripples Community and Platform. Um, she's frustrated with the lack of representation and unaddressed discrimination faced by black and non-black people of color living with disabilities each and every day. With a focus on women, femme, and non-binary folks, um, Jamoke co-created the platform to increase visibility and highlight the narratives of these invisible populations within an invisible population. Owing to her personal and professional background, Jamoke gives special consideration to those that are multiply marginalized and is relentless in her pursuit to transform the outcomes of those here and yet to come. I just would like to really quickly say co-founded. I was co-founded with Kim Oliver. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and to my right, we have uh, Paisy Mahmoud, um, a British Kurd and campaigner at ICRO campaign, I'm sorry, um, ICRO Women's Rights Organization. Um, uh, she campaigns to end harmful practices, including child marriage, FGM, virginity testing, and hymenoplasty, drawing her own, on her own lived experiences. And Paisy's TEDx talk, A Survivor's Plea to End Child Marriage, which I hope you will watch at some point, has been viewed more than a million times. And her petition in support of ICRO's Safeguard Futures Ban Child Marriage Campaign has attracted more than 189,000 signatures. Um, Pacey's advocacy has resulted in her being named UK Parliament Volunteer of the Year 2021, and she was celebrated with special recognition at the UN Women UK Awards 2020. And she's a member of the Girls Not Brides Advisory Committee. And finally, we have Laura Bates, um, who is the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, an ever-increasing collection of over 200,000 testimonies of gender inequality with branches around the world. And Laura works closely with politicians, police forces, businesses, schools, and organizations from the United Nations to the Council of Europe to tackle sexism and sexual violence. Um, she is patron of Somerset and Avon Rape and Sexual Abuse Support and contributor at Women Under Siege, a New York-based organization working to end the use of rape as a weapon of war in conflict zones worldwide. And she's a best-selling author of many books, including Everyday Sexism, Girl Up, and Women Who Hate Women, and Men Who Hate Women, sorry. Although we can discuss Women Who Hate Women as well, because <laughs> that is an issue. Men Who Hate Women, and writes regularly for the New York Times, The Guardian, The Telegraph, and others. And Laura's an honorary fellow at St. John's Cam College, Cambridge, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. And finally, you might wonder who I am. I'm Winnie M. Lee, and I'm an author and activist and a, a rape survivor as well. Um, my book, Dark Chapter, is a kind of fictional reimagining of my real-life stranger rape, which took place 
13 and a half years ago today. Um, and that experience of rape obviously kind of kickstarted all the work I do. Um, I also founded something called the Clear Lines Festival six years ago, which is kind of scrappy forerunner precursor to Shameless. Um, it was kind of entirely volunteer run and crowdfunded. And we put together a whole bunch of different um, talks and uh, artistic performances addressing sexual violence and consent because I think we felt it was important to create a space where we can talk openly about these issues. And it's amazing to see Shameless Festival doing the same thing today with a bigger budget and a bigger venue, um, because as we know, this issue is really important to talk about continually and every day. And I'm also a researcher at the LSC, where I'm researching how rape survivors are engaging with the media as a form of activism themselves. Um, so anyway, we have a really great panel with us. And I guess we may as well just dive into the topic of everyday sexual violence. Um, and what does that what does that phrase mean to you? Because um, I think it's the everydayness, it's the normalization of these experiences that we really want to highlight in this panel. And I'm going to start with Laura, just because there's an obvious similarity to the name of your project, which is everyday sexism. Um, so when you hear the term everyday sexual violence, what, what does that mean to you, particularly in relation to, to your project? Um, well, when I used the term everyday and everyday sexism, it was very deliberately a, a double meaning which was firstly the fact that this is happening every day, so it's about frequency, it's about how severe the problem is, and secondly, about the normalization. So it is happening every day, but it is so every day that we don't necessarily see it, we don't necessarily notice it. And I think for me it speaks to the perception gap between the lived daily experiences of women and minoritized genders and the perception of the general public about both the scale and the severity of the problem. And I think that that is what often prevents us from overcoming and tackling the problem that people won't recognize it. And what that looks like, I think, in my work is partly the connections, the connections between the things that we're told, brush it off, don't make a fuss, you didn't really mean it, you've got the wrong end of the stick, take it as a compliment. I'd love it if someone said something like that to me, lighten up, get a sense of humor. And the reality of those experiences as they are felt by a survivor. So the idea that we don't make a fuss about the small stuff, but that it doesn't happen se separately, that this is a continuum. I think the term everyday for me is really important because there are links, there is a spectrum that includes the low level sexual harassment, wolf whistling, street harassment, and the more severe workplace discrimination, sexual violence, domestic abuse. And until we recognize that spectrum, it's very difficult to overcome. I think the everyday for me looks like um, a school visit I did recently where um, I was talking to a group of 13-year-olds, and one of the exercises I asked them to do is to talk about how their life might be different if they were a different sex. It's a way to try and help them to realize how much their life is often shaped and restricted by gender stereotypes. And usually when the boys respond, this is quite a light-hearted exercise. You know, they make jokes and talk about clothes and about sports, and there's a lot to unpack there. But after this, one girl put her hand up, and when I called on her, she said, if I was a boy, I wouldn't be scared all the time. And she was 13 years old. And as soon as she said that, the other girls in the room started pouring out experiences. They had learned to protect themselves. They were talking about holding their hockey sticks gripped in their hands as they went home from practice in case somebody attacked them. And their common lived experience is one of recognizing that they were expected by society to defend themselves, that we don't see sexual violence as something that can be tackled. We see it as an inevitability that women should be trained from the age of 13 to avoid. So that's every day for me as well, the idea of an inevitability. And finally, the last thing I think that for me screams every day about this is the way in which that inevitability comes through in our politics. So for me, there was this, this gross juxtaposition earlier this year where we had an outpouring of testimonies from incredibly courageous young women through the Everyone's Invited initiative about sexual violence in schools, suggesting that this was an enormous issue, that it was impacting lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And the government response was to say, that sounds absolutely shocking, which of course it wasn't because they knew they had these statistics five years earlier. They knew they just hadn't bothered to act on it and to go, um, we'll do another inquiry. That was their response. And a few days later, we heard about the Super League, which if anyone didn't follow the story, was this big European football league that was set up that apparently people saw as a kind of desperate challenge to domestic football. And I don't mean to make light of that, but that was, that was the problem. And the headlines on every single newspaper front page that day were about the desperate threat to our nation and how we had to fight back. Prince William was involved, the royals were speaking out, and Boris Johnson essentially seemed to just clear his diary for two days. He was like, we're in meetings, we're meeting with fans, 
Downs. We've got representatives. We're calling in the lawyers to Downing Street. I promise we won't let this happen. We will stop this devastating threat. And they did. Within a few days, they had fixed it with what seemed to be an unremitting spotlight from the top of our government. And the difference in response to those two things, for me, was devastating. And that's what every day means to me in this context, that sexual violence has become so normalized that it is acceptable to our government that 80% of girls say sexual assault is common in their friendship groups at school. And yet a threat to our national game is something that has to be and can be shut down and acted on immediately. Thank you, Laura. And that's And that, that's a great example of the impact that the media as an industry can have on what issues are constantly in the public eye and which ones aren't, and ultimately how, you know, how the government and how different resources are put towards fixing some problems and not others. Um, Jamoke, uh, I'm going to ask you, when you hear the term everyday sexual violence, what does that mean to you in the work that you do? Yep, thank you. So in the work that I do with the triple cripples, we look at the way that representation or like thereof of... Um, minoritized, multiply minoritized and marginalized people not being represented in the media affects them. And essentially there was recently an article actually put out by um, Lucy Webster about disabled women and you know, kind of like the sexual violence and everyday kind of like abuse that, um, that they face. And it was a case of compared to the national average, I think it was almost twice as likely for disabled women to be sexually assaulted or face sexual harassment compared to non-disabled women. And it's a case of when you actually include race within that, when you include other different um, protected characteristics, like these examples and these percentages would actually get higher, but unfortunately we don't actually have the stats for that. But I can give an example of when um, it was in the news everywhere about Harvey Weinstein and you know all the awful, awful things he'd done over decades and had been um, enabled to do over decades. And these women, these amazing and courageous women, were coming out, you know, with their own um, harrowing experiences of him. And the two that I distinctly remember that he argued against were women of color, Salma Hayek and Lupita Nyong'o. So if we actually look at this in a way that who are we? less likely to believe. So first of all, disabled women are infantilized and desexualized. So anything of a sexual nature, it's like, why would it pertain to you? Nobody's looking at you in such a manner. And that's the issue. Because nobody's looking, it's able to go undetected. It's able to just kind of like be brushed off in the case of like, why would this ever happen? You are not somebody that is seen as um, sexually attractive, somebody that some people would want. And it's not even, because it's not that you want to be put in that position, but it's just a case of like, if nobody believes that you can experience sex, sexuality, etc. So when these awful things do happen to you, nobody's going to believe it because, well, why would they? You have been desexualized and being from a minoritized background through your race as well, it's a case of you are at the bottom rung. So nobody will care even if that does happen to you, but we especially don't believe that that happens to you. So for us and the work we do, it's the triple cripples is like, we need to look at these statistics because I promise you, I promise you, like it will be a lot worse because nobody's looking and nobody cares to look. And that's what enables it to happen all of the time so frequently. And it's a case of, if nobody's gonna believe me anyway, why would I even speak up? Exactly. Thank you, um, Jamoke. And, and Paisy, um, in relation to, to the work that you do, um, and, uh, and obviously you work with particular communities on, on specific issues and experiences, um, what does the term everyday sexual violence mean? Um, I think what it means to me is the fact that it exists pretty much in every space that women and girls go into. Um, and it's all these micro contributions that um, make this issue so terrible. Um, if I take you on a little bit of a journey, I mean, from a personal experience, I remember as young as being six years old and growing up in quite a big family with a lot of cousins that were boys and being told to sit a certain way as young as six and being told that, you know, there is shame in the way that I sit or in the way that I behave. And when I think about that now, I still feel so much anger in my body that as a child, I was already... Um, you know, being told that my body carries shame and that I could potentially come across as over-sexual at that age. 
And then when I think back to being a teenager, fast forward to being on a bus in London at the age of 15, I remember sitting, coming home from work experience and sitting at the back of the bus and a boy who was quite clearly older than me, he was touching my hair. And so I told him off about three times. The third time I just got up and I, I swore at him and he punched me straight in my jaw in a public space on a London bus and not a single person reacted. It was about three o'clock, so very busy time of the day. And that to me, again, just reiterates that this type of stuff happens in every space. And it's almost like as a, you know, as a girl, as a woman, you have to train yourself to always be on guard. And I, I think Laura referenced this. Um, and then again, when I was um, 16, I was a child bride in London. And for me, that monitoring and always being on guard really escalated because I now felt like my husband was having everybody, you know, his friends and his extended family members always um, monitor my behavior. And that would not only get back to my parents, but it would also get back to him. So it was like that double monitoring. And it's really this um, in my life experience that led to the tragic honor killing of my sister because when she left an abusive marriage, she was also a child bride and she fell in love with somebody else. She was seen as, you know, really stepping out and breaking the code for actually choosing her own intimate partner. And that is, to me, the level it can escalate to. And, it, you know, it's, it's really scary to think about, but so many women and girls start their days thinking, how can I protect myself? And this is an issue that exists in every single space and it's just constant monitoring and having to watch over your back so in the work that we do there's quite um we look through this um through a lens of on a based abuse where you don't just feel that fear from you know maybe an intimate partner or a stranger you feel that from family you know intimate partners extended family community so it's just in every space and that to me is when i think of everyday sexual violence and sexism it straight away alarms me. It's everywhere. It's all around us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paisley. I mean, I guess in terms of my own personal experience around sexual violence, I I'm going to provide a slightly different experience because I um, started traveling on my own when I was 15, 16. Um, and for me, like the greatest joy in life, and still is, right, is traveling, right, and traveling on my own. And um, I, for, I, I, kind of in the back of my head, there'd always been as a girl, obviously you grow up with, with an awareness that rape exists and that it can be something that happens to you. But I started traveling quite early on and there were obviously some scary experiences, but nothing really bad happened. So I kind of laughed it off. Um, for example, when a guy offered me a lift and then asked me to have sex with him, and I, but I managed to escape. So I kind of used that story as like a, a funny, scary story of something that happened to me when I was traveling. Um, and so I kind of went through life for, you know, from 15, 16 traveling my own up until the age of 29, like tr really, really cool experiences traveling on my own, uh, meeting great people, never having anything bad happen to me. So I had kind of felt, maybe not invincible, but I kind of felt like, okay, now as a woman uh, going through the world, living an adventurous life, like this is this is possible, right? Um, so a lot of that kind of early fear that you maybe grow up with had kind of been shed from my life by the time I reached 29. And then when I was 29, I was walking through a park and approached by a 15 year old boy who wasn't particularly threatening. He was just wanted to have a weird chat with me. Um, and then little to my knowledge, he kept following me. And then I, I reached a more isolated part of the park and uh, he showed up again and he was suddenly very threatening. And then by that point, I would realize this is a very dangerous, violent person, um, but there's no one else around. So it became a quite violent um, assault and rape. And it was very shocking for me to be at that age, 29, thinking like I'm a grown woman and you know I've traveled around the world lots on my own. And then suddenly I'm confronted with a kid half my age who's capable of that kind of violence. Um, and then that, that changed my life, right? And so it's 13 and a half years on, and obviously now I do a whole bunch of work around sexual violence, but I was in some ways quite blind, despite having traveled around the world a lot, I was quite blind to the everyday nature and the frequency of sexual violence until it entered my life. Um, and I guess one of the poignant things about that is that, you know, again, I was a grown woman when that happened, so I, I by that point, I, I realized that it was rape, right? And if I was half my age, I might have been more ashamed about things. Um, and again, it fit the traditional stranger myth, the stranger rape myth. It was, 
you know, we, we think of rape when you, if you watch the movies about, you know, it's a woman walking in a strange place on her own and she's attacked by a stranger and that's what happened to me, right? So for me, I was able to like quite clearly realize that what happened to me was rape. And I did, ca I called a friend right away afterwards um, and I said, I, I don't know what happened, but I think I've just been raped, right? And she answered right away, um, oh my God, are you okay? Are you safe right now? Can you stay on the line? I'll call the police, right? And I have to thank her so much for having that kind of reaction, right? Because I could have called a different friend and said, and she would have asked what have happened. And in my mind, I might have said, well, I met this strange kid and he wanted to have sex. You know, I mean, there's any number of ways I could have described that where another person could have reacted and said, well, that sounds weird. I'll meet you tonight for a pint kind of thing, right? Um, and kind of minimized, and not quite normalized it, but minimized the severity of what have happened to me. But my friend Mary Lou was, she reacted right away and said, no, I'll, get, I'll call the police and say where you are. Um, and if she'd reacted differently, I might have suppressed it and never told anyone else and just thought about that weird thing that happened to me when I'd gone hiking and probably tried to live the rest of my life um, traumatized and suppressing that trauma um, with, with a number of different um, things that could uh, kind of result from that kind of suppression of trauma. Um, but she reacted well. And, and that first disclosure is really key in terms of a victim trying to get the help and the support that they need to try to recover. Um, I later learned on that Mary Lou herself had been a victim of, of rape and a few years prior she'd been drugged um, by somebody when she was out at a bar and she woke up in a room on her own. Um, and it was maybe possibly because of her own experience that she reacted so well to what had happened to me and then reacted so well to my own disclosure. So in some ways I have to thank her, but then there's the incredible tragedy of the fact that sometimes it takes another victim or another survivor to recognize the severity of what happens to you. And when we talk about everyday sexual violence, it's, it's, it's every day because it's that frequent, but then it shouldn't be that suppressed that you require another victim, another person to have lived that kind of tragic experience to actually get the, the resources and the support and the belief you need. Um, so I guess for me personally, that's what that term means to me, everyday sexual violence, the fact that it's there, it's that frequent, but it's often so little spoken about. Um, can we talk about why we think it's become so normalized? Why, why is sexual violence become so normalized? Has it always been this normalized? Has there ever been a society where it hasn't been this normalized and what enables it to be so normalized in some ways? Um, does anyone wanna jump in there? Um, I would say it's definitely normalized. Um, I think we need to think back to like from the very, very early age of girls and boys, there are all these messages. I mean, sometimes you really step back and you look at things like clothing, for example, and the messaging on boys and girls' clothing, and you just, it's so shocking the kind of things that are out there. And we might not really read into them, but actually looking back, you know, from a distance, these messages, we're telling little boys, you know, don't punch like a girl and, you know, all these like cliche sayings, they are so important and these are messages that boys grow up with and they start to feel entitled and invisible. And I think for girls on the complete opposite, where we're teaching girls through all these little messages that girls are soft and girls are gentle and, you know, girls don't fight and girls don't do this and girls are weak. And it, to me, it starts there. It's all the things that we're saying to children all the way into adulthood, and they just become so embedded. And as a girl, you know, you grow up and you think, I just have to take care of myself everywhere I go on the tube. You, you just get uptight the minute you get on a packed tube because you never know. Someone might, might just casually, you know, grope you in a bar, just anywhere in a supermarket. And I think it's, we, we all have to kind of sometimes step back and actually ask ourselves, what is it? the messages that we're spreading. You know, those casual little things that seem little, but they are contributing to why women and girls are experiencing sexual violence every single day of their lives. So I think we need to really address that. To me, that's one of the first things. Thank you, that's, that's very important. Um, and yeah, it is, that, as Laura mentioned, that continuum of starting from like the low level comments, um, the low level harassment, building up to experiences of, of violence, um, you know, and, and ongoing abuse. I mean, I, I think in my instance, um, I often think about my, sort of my, my perpetrator, right, and he was 15 years old. And I mean, nobody starts, you don't go from zero 
to violently assaulting a strange woman that you see, right? I mean, there would have been a series of escalating perpetrations that he committed, maybe, you know, touching a girl's hair and punching her on in the, in the bus and not being held accountable for that. So there would have been a series of things that he did that he managed to get away with that allowed him to build up to the level of violence that he showed me. Um, so I often wonder, like, why wasn't he caught or held accountable prior to that, um, which, which calls into question the importance of calling things out and, and, and you know, and reporting these experiences and reporting these, um, these crimes, um, because that could be stopping somebody in their tracks from assaulting another person. Um, Jamoke, do you have any thoughts, I guess, on, on why it becomes so normalized or why it's become so normalized, particularly in relation to the disabled community um, and, I suppose, what, what concrete steps can be done to stop that normalization? Well, in terms of um, normalization and, you know, kind of like looking at disability, like I previously mentioned, it's a case of being a disabled woman, you're desexualized, you're infantilized, but being a black woman, you're hypersexualized. It's like, oh my goodness, like this Jezebel who's always, you know, kind of like up for it and kind of like game as well. And... I think the normalization, especially with the work that the Triple Cripple does within the media, we have to look at the media that is being consumed and the media that we are kind of like talking about and sharing. So something that I've noticed for the past, I don't know, I want to say couple, three years or whatever is, um, and it's coming from women actually, talking about um, choking during sex and sexual encounters and kind of like making light of it. It's just kind of like, oh yeah, you know, like choking is something that I like, choking is this, choking is that, whatever. And for me, it was like quite strange and quite an odd thing because like if anybody puts their hand around my neck, like I'm gonna scream first of all, like what the hell are you doing? But we're getting into such a place and of course it would come from like pornography and like pornographic material where it's just kind of like oh if you don't want to have this kind of sex then you know you're vanilla you know you're not like as sexually exciting as I would want and you're not necessarily somebody that I would want to have sex with but then we see the way that it goes from pornography to this being used as a legitimate excuse and reason you know kind of like within court cases and then killing actually killing women and it's just kind of like oh yeah you know that's something that she wanted and of course you can't ask the woman because she's dead right and it's a case of kind of like this normalization of these kind of actions and I'm not even putting the blame on the women because within a patriarchal you know society I don't want to be I don't want to be like those girls who are no fun I'm the cool girl you know I love choking I love you know what boys like to do and it might not necessarily be something that's coming from them but it's just kind of like if you want to be accepted if you want to be seen as the cool girl the fun one the one that's not a nag the one that's not always complaining about this talking about feminism then you have to be up for these things and it's kind of like I feel like sometimes it's a performance as well like you have to perform being cool you know for the male gaze and for your male audience and men don't actually even need to be around for us to still perform for the patriarchy and when you add disability and of like within that it's just kind of it's a very very scary position to be in so for me I'm um, visibly disabled and so I use a caliper and I use a leg brace and even like either late primary school or like early secondary school age so like 10 11 or whatever like I would watch films and especially kind of like let's say your films where you have the person running away and the person chasing the person that's running away I can't run away and most importantly I look like I cannot run away right and at such a young age even though it's just kind of like you're thinking about it's like oh I wish I wasn't disabled I wish I could do the things that my friends do I kind of saw my caliper my leg brace as something that could potentially protect me because if you, and it's awful to be thinking about that at 10 and 11, and it's always, it's not something that's at the forefront of my mind, but it's something that I kind of hold in the back of my mind, like women hold keys between their fingers, right? It's like, even if I am caught, which you probably will be, at least it'll be difficult. At least it'll be difficult. At least I'll be given just a little bit of time to, I don't know, maybe try and wrangle myself free or yell or do something, and it buys me time. So something that I try to kind of like minimize and like shy away from is something that could potentially protect me. But then that speaks to the inevitability of it that you've all been speaking about. It's just kind of like, 
as such a young child, I was like, this is probably something that may well happen, but at least I have this thing that could at least slow them down or at least make me not seem as such a target. But the downside of that is, and I never want any woman, any person to come to harm. It's like, I'm hoping that it's not me. But in that kind of way, I'm just kind of like, okay, I don't seem like the ideal candidate. We're actually saying, I hope you get somebody else, which of course you don't want to, but it's just kind of like you have to focus on yourself yeah. when everything, all of the messaging, as soon as you were a child, when you grow up and you become an adult and you become a woman, it's just kind of like, how can I mitigate this inevitability? And that's a very horrifying and scary thing, especially for somebody that kind of like has to try and rely on certain things that could slow them down, meaning that it would slow somebody else down. Then looking at my crutches as weapons, like how would I get myself out of this situation? And, you know, I love traveling. Like I've traveled like all over, um, all over the world and it's something that, you kind of try to figure out little escape routes. It's always in the back of your mind. It's like, if something was to happen right now, if I no longer became safe for any reason, what would happen? Okay, it's go time. And that's a very high level of alertness to have to be in all the time, whether you're awake or when you're asleep as well. Yeah, and just uh, just the kind of mental load or the or the emotional load of always having to be alert and think about that is, is something, and it's something that a lot of women disabled or not do often have to think about, and I think that's come up in our conversation about walking home late at night, worrying about your escape routes or the person that's walking behind you. Um, and whenever I talk to men, like, oftentimes they don't think about that, right? Um, it's, yeah, um, so the amount of like mental energy and emotional energy we put into thinking about ways to keep ourselves safe is, is something I'd love to free up, right? Because I could think about other stuff, right? Um, but Laura, I mean, you've received like hundreds and thousands of testimonies through your website and through your project from, from women and girls a, about these issues. And, um, and I wonder, this, this notion of inevitability um, that Jumoke brought up and the inevitability of being attacked or assaulted or something like that, how, how often has that come up in, in the testimonies you receive? I mean, constantly, really, really frequently. And it comes from a world in which we normalize it to such a degree that when a girl is seven or eight years old and she first experiences sexual harassment or worse, the response that she most often gets from the first responder, which is very often, sadly, a family member or even a teacher, is either well, what were you wearing? What were you doing at the time? Did you lead him on? Were you asking for it? Or, oh, don't make a fuss. That's part of being a girl. It happens all the time. I think that, I don't think you can separate normalization from misogyny. I think if we are asking where the normalization of sexual violence comes from, I think it comes from a society where misogyny is the norm. Those two things are inextricably connected because you don't reach a point where somebody, just as you say, commits an assault out of nowhere. You reach it from a society where we grow up being prepared. Girls grow up being prepared to be submissive, to make themselves small, to keep themselves safe, but also accepting that at some point something bad might happen to them. And the most heartbreaking thing about those project entries is that they so frequently end a list of somebody's lifetime of harassment and assault and abuse, and it ends with a phrase, I know I've been lucky, really, or I know it could have been worse. So we are so socialized and indoctrinated into that inevitability, but also boys are socialized and indoctrinated into a form of masculinity where their very proof of their own value is based in the subjugation and degradation of women throughout. And what that means is that we get to a point where somebody sexually assaults and murders a woman and we call them a bad apple. You know, or Harvey Weinstein, the front pages, they called him a beast, the monster of Tinseltown. It's an aberration. How could we have got there? But it's not a bad apple. It's not a coincidence. You get there from having a police force where you've got people nicknaming somebody the rapist and they continue to keep their job in that position, where you've got people WhatsApping, allegedly, group messages that are homophobic and racist and misogynistic, where you've got hundreds of police officers in the Met alone accused of sexual offences and only 18% of those officers accused, alleged to have sexually assaulted someone or sexual offences ever coming up against any kind of disciplinary action. That's the society and the context in which these supposed aberrations happen. And it means that they're happening so frequently that we see them as isolated incidents because we only pick up on one or two, because so many women are dying that we literally can't remember all of their names. And it means that we remember the names of someone like Sarah Everard, who ends up on the front pages because she's a white, middle-class young woman who's very pretty, and the and Twitter can erupt with thousands and thousands of tweets that all said the same thing. 
She was just walking home, and she did all the right things. Those were the phrases that trended after Sarah Everard's death, and it told us everything you needed to know about that normalization in our society. This was wrong because she didn't deserve it, because she was following the rules. And the natural conclusion of that is what? That if she hadn't been just walking home, she, it wouldn't have been such a tragedy, she would have deserved it, and that is, that is literally what we're saying. And it means that we only hear about those cases, that the belated outcry about Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman only came a year after their deaths in Wembley Park because people realized that the outcry hadn't been there in the way that it was for Sarah, even though they too had been violated after their deaths by police officers who took photos of their bodies. We didn't hear about the older women who were murdered during lockdown because we don't hear about these stories, disabled women who experience abuse at twice the rate of non-disabled women and yet whose stories don't add up on the front pages. And so I think that normalization also leads to a point where we're almost so overwhelmed by it that we can't see it anymore. And so we isolate these incidents. And it's not, it's not. The opposite of isolated incidents, of course, are a pattern. But we're not seeing the pattern because we're so desensitized to it. We're so used to it that we just accept it as normal. No, thanks, those are really important points. And, and again, I, I can't, stress enough how much like our awareness of this issue is, is in some ways dependent on the media um, and it shouldn't be dependent on the media because as we know the media is a very flawed industry with, with particular biases um, and that's the importance of having kind of spaces like this which fine have some aspects of media to it because I'm telling everyone to tweet on social media but the importance of having kind of real life um, you know spaces where we can talk and actual share share the live reality without having to go through you know, whatever uh, whatever the Times decides to run as a deadline for the day, right? Um, so I, I guess for me, so there's, there's the power of the media in terms of, of choosing which stories they want to spotlight and which aspects of certain issues they want to spotlight. Um, there's also just, and we spoke about the cultural representations. Uh, I mean, in particular, for my case, uh, I'm going to bring up the issue of, of East Asian women um, and how we are often sexualized, eroticized, um, and the impact that can have on on the reality of how people react and, move and, and act towards East Asian women. And again, you know, going back to my rape, because for me that's always gonna be like the lens through which I see this, even though I know it's not representative of every experience out there. Um, you know, 15 year old boy who approached me in the park and then later on violently assaulted me, and during the rape he said a, a, sexu a sexualized Asian, uh, racialized slur about Asian women. Um, at that point, I was already being assaulted, so I was just kind of like, oh, on top of all this, you're a racist, right? Um, but I also, you know, and, and so for me, that wasn't like the deepest cut, but I'm very conscious of the fact that, like, how did he get this image in his mind or this notion of an East Asian woman having a particular sexual attribute, right? Um, and that could have only come through something like porn or some form of media that he consumed this kind of cultural product, if that's what we're gonna call porn. Um, unfortunately it is, because people consume it. And, they, and, and he somehow developed this idea about East Asian women, and did that lead to him assaulting me? I don't know, if, if I was white, he could have probably quite easily assaulted me as well. But it did contribute to his, his maybe thinking in that there was there was something sexualized about East Asian women that needed to be sampled or something, right? So, you know, that link between the, the stuff that's out there, pornography, the cultural representation of women, and an actual lived violence is there, and, and it was very much there in my own experience. So, um, you know, for me, I, I try not to think too much about it, but then I'm like, no, but that, you know, if, if, he, if that 15-year-old boy had grown up in a different environment, hadn't been exposed to porn, you know, if somebody had called out other um, forms of violence that he'd committed, like, I wouldn't have been assaulted, right? And other women probably wouldn't have been assaulted as well. Um, so, I mean, I guess in, in terms of what structural changes we can do to change either eliminating um, everyday sexual violence um, in, in general or towards certain demographics, um, I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask to, uh, our panel, I mean, if there's one or two specific steps that could be done um, in terms of eliminating every sexual violence in, um, on, in, in the areas that you work on, what, what would you suggest? So I'm gonna start with Paisy. Um, so the organization I work for, ICRO, we predominantly um, support and advocate for Middle Eastern, North African, um, and Afghan women and girls. And the issues that we work on are um, FGM, child marriage, forced marriage, and virginity testing, and hymenoplasty. And I can't tell you in my campaigning um, journey over the last few years with ICRO how often it comes up as this is a cultural issue. And it's so frustrating because as somebody who's experienced um, all the things I just mentioned, 
when somebody says to me, well, this is part of a particular culture or community, what that tells me is you deserve to go through that because this is part of your culture. When actually nobody should have to hear that this is part of their culture. I'm, you know, all I, all I wanted was to be safe as a young girl and to have the opportunities that every single person, every human deserves, you know, just equal rights. But to me, there's this big, um, you know, there's this big focus on this community or that culture. And it really takes away from when we're talking about abuse. Essentially, this is all it comes down to. And one of the things I campaigned on for years um, is child marriage. And you must have seen it in the news, or I hope you did, because it's pretty good news. Um, the law is going to change in relation to that. And that's something that I've, you know, through the campaign, I've had conversations with decision makers who have said to me, yeah, but isn't this only happening in certain communities? And it's so heartbreaking because we're talking about children. I mean, over a 10-year span of 2007 to 2017, 3,000 children in the UK were married as children. And th these are only registered marriages that we're talking about. So we have to recognize the, the multi-layered complexities that some people face and um, why they face them, but they cannot be used against us for why we experience sexual violence or any other form of abuse. And I think when we think about structural, um, you know, structural um, inequalities, you have to address that and you have to stop th seeing abuse through this is happening to you because of your identity. And all that says to you is, well, actually, you don't really matter because you're from this community or this is your culture. This is normalized, this is okay. And it adds a huge, huge level of acceptance because as a young girl, you think to yourself, well, then if this happens in my culture, I just have to accept it. When my sister's um, honor killing was in the press and reported on, all you ever saw was she was a Muslim girl and this happened because of this. You know, there was no mention of she was monitored. This was male violence. You know, this was some, this was about control. This was about taking back control and onus from a young woman who just wanted to make her life choices. And it boiled down to she was a Muslim woman who was murdered by her family. And it, it just really strips back the issues and it doesn't give us the opportunity to actually look at the violence that is happening. So what steps in terms of police and criminal justice system um, do you think are, need to be taken to, 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 to focus on these particular issues? I think see abuse for what it is. Recognize the abuse and address why is this happening. Don't blame the victim because this is essentially blaming and holding somebody's identity a reason to why they experience this. No one's identity, culture, religion, you know, sex, nothing should be the justification for why you experience this. So I think professionals need to just see abuse and recognize it and act on it because they have a duty to care and that's what they should be doing. Exactly, thank you very much. Um, and Jamoke, in terms of um, the work that you do, I mean, what uh, you mentioned earlier just about like the research isn't there in some ways around um, experiences of sexual violence um, in the disabled community. So, so that's one thing. There could be more academics researching that. Or there can be pol more policy makers researching that. Um, are there any other um, specific steps that you would recommend to start to begin to address this issue in relation to the disabled community? Um, yeah, I certainly would look at um, what we're teaching in schools, because um, at least I remember back when um, I was in school, um, we were separated by um, like the gender that we presented as. So the boys had sex education over here, and the girls had sex education over there, and it wasn't ever mixed, and they only ever spoke about the, um, the mechanics of it. And also what could go wrong is like, if you have sex, you will get herpes. And, you know, just kind of like showing all of these very distressing images. Whereas I think we need to broaden, you know, the conversation kind of like around sex and relationships, et cetera. And also, yeah, look at relationships, look at um, what happens kind of like interpersonally before it gets to the place of sex. And it's like, yes, this can be seen as a positive, but there are certain steps in which, hey, like you're able to, um, like Paisley said, see things for what they are. Like actually, no, this isn't okay. You are like asking me and over and over and over and over and over again until I get a yes is not a yes. That's coercion, you know? And kind of like within the curriculum, looking at sex education, that we include different kinds of sex, different kinds of sexuality and different kinds of people being 
in um, those kind of like sexual um, interactions and relations, those that are disabled, those that are queer, those that are people of different races, those that might look at um, what it could be depending on somebody's like religion or spirituality, you know, kind of like for example, and kind of like embedding that within it because when we just kind of like take a blanket view looking at things, what we're actually saying is like, especially within the UK, this is how white people have sex. So this is how, you know, and we're looking at it as like, and this is actually how cisgendered heterosexual white people have sex. And it's like, okay, so what does that mean for the black queer kid, you know? Or what does that mean for the students that might think that they're asexual? It's like actually sexual desire. If you don't have it, that's actually perfectly normal. And if you are um, disabled, depending on your disability, like there's different ways in which people can have sex and it doesn't necessarily need to involve, you know, like a penis and vagina and kind of like broaden, you know, kind of like these aspects because people carry a hell of a lot of shame within themselves kind of like around this particular topic. And the earlier that we have these conversations, the better. And we normalize the ways that different people have sex because oftentimes you'll see kind of like disabled people being desexualized and then you're surprised when you find a disabled woman that has a baby and it's like wait a minute how the hell did this happen what what's going on here so that wouldn't be so weird so i definitely think education is a huge part to it and we have to certainly at least again with the work that i do the media is so important and it's so overreaching right we have to look at the media that's being consumed we have to see what is being normalized the way that we're talking about east asian women the way we're talking about black women the way that we're talking about muslim women and also the way that we're talking about white women as well because it does a disservice to all of us you know so yeah i think media and education. Great. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and Laura, I mean, you've been running the Everyday Sexism Project for years and, and work directly and consult with, um, you know, policymakers and the police and kind of higher bodies out there. I mean, so you probably have made concrete recommendations. And I'm just curious, like, what are some of the ones that you've, things that you, steps you've been recommending and how have people been reacting? Like, how do policymakers react to your suggestions? Um, well, there's resistance, <laughs> I think. Um, I think we need to move away from the isolated approach, which insists on policing women's behavior and into a recognition of the systemic problem, which means root and branch change within institutions. I think there are five systems in the UK that are contributing to the problem where systemic misogyny and racism and other forms of inequality are affecting us. I think they're education, media, policing, politics, and the criminal justice system. And I think that if we undertook a really thorough um, review of those with an actual open-minded um, uh, willingness to see institutional shift, we'd see a real change. But I think, I think we need to see two different kinds of shifts. I think we need a cultural shift, a shift in ideas and attitudes, and that's slow and it takes time, but it can happen. And I think if we're talking about concrete solutions, because there are so few of those in this work, funding for frontline service Absolutely. provision. It's so odd. This is one of the things we could do that would actually make a difference. And we're still battling for it. There's a donkey sanctuary in the West Country that has three times as much funding as all the rape crisis centers put together. You know, we've seen this slashing in funding for frontline services in the last decade, particularly affecting by and for services run by and for black and minoritized women. We've got a situation where between um, a fifth and a quarter of women in the UK are disabled, but fewer than a tenth the refuge spaces are accessible. So the difference in what we have and what we need there is something that we could fix if we were to put behind it a little bit of the will and money that we put behind you know, the, the Super League thing, for example. But the cultural shift will take longer and it won't be as easy, but there are ways to do it. It's, it's the media. It's not having the Today program asking if Me Too is a witch hunt. It's not having The Sun run, running an article saying that actually a man killing his wife might be understandable. There's education and what we're teaching young people and how we're teaching them to be open about challenging this stuff and then there's daily actions that each every one of us personal tiny things in our own lives that we might feel won't have a ripple effect or a big impact and they don't necessarily look like what we think of when we think of activism they don't necessarily look like signing a petition or going on a march 
it's tiny things. It's the, the man who wrote to the Everyday Sexism Project to say that he'd been reading these stories and had never thought about it before. And he de determined that he would do something if he saw this happening again. And he was walking down the street and he walked past a building site. There were two women ahead of him on the pavement. And the guy started shouting at them, specifically shouting, get your tits out. And he said, I panicked because this was my moment and I had to do something. But I, I couldn't think of the speech and everything went out of my head. And the moment was passing and I knew that I had to act. So I panicked and I lifted up my t-shirt and I showed them mine instead. <laughs> and I know that's really silly, and I know it's tiny, but actually, it was effective. It got across the message, you, you wouldn't do it to me, so why are you doing it to them? Or the woman who said that she was walking down the street and there was a guy working up on a roof, and he started shouting harassment at her, which, of course, she was used to, as we all are, but for the first time, she felt emboldened to shout back because he was safely at a distance. So she challenged him, you know? She said something like, I wouldn't shout about your genitals while you're walking down the street, so why are you doing it to me? And it didn't go so well. He started shouting worse abuse. So she took down his ladder and she left him up there to think about it. And I know that's tiny, I know that's really small, but I told this story at a book festival that year because I thought it was so, it just really struck me. And I got an email from the organizers the next week saying, I thought you'd like to know there were a group of women in your session at the festival. And on their way to the next session, a guy on a roof started shouting stuff at them. So before he'd even had a chance to really get much out, they just grabbed his ladder and ran off with it. So these things spread, right? They have a ripple effect. It might feel like a tiny thing that each of us can do, but it's that normalization and that misogyny that I really believe is so linked to the more serious things that feel far away and harder to challenge. I really do think we can challenge them individually if we each pledge to disrupt that normalization whenever it crosses our own path. What I will say, absolutely important point, is that I would put the onus of that on the men. Yeah. Because let's be honest, as depending on where you are, what the situation might be, your safety is incredibly important. Like Paisy said, you could call it out and you could get punched in the face. Men need to do better. It can't be on us, those that are facing it, having to do the work ourselves. You need to pull up boys and men and make sure that it's not happening because the issue doesn't lie with us. Hear, hear. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think about all the conversations we're having here today, all the work that we do outside of today, um, all the academic research that's taking place, and in some ways it's all for naught if that message isn't reaching the men, if it's not, mess if it's not reaching the perpetrators and potential perpetrators out there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's great all the work that all of us have been doing, um, and I continue to applaud it and encourage it, but please let's have that conversation reach men and boys as well. Um, we unfortunately are out of time, so um, I, I mean, I feel like we could talk for another hour, frankly, but I mean, there's lots of other things happening um, at, uh, at the Shameless Festival today, um, so please do check out your programs. Um, I'm running a creative writing project, uh, well, running two creative writing workshops later on today um, with Claire Shaw um, for survivors of sexual abuse um, and violence. So if you want to sign up for those, please do that. Um, Laura's book is on sale at the bookstall back there. My book is on sale there as well. I'd be happy to sign copies. Um, and uh, yeah, again, if you feel like you need to speak to somebody about this, um, there are counselors you can speak to at the Survivors Trust here and at the marketplace. Um, but please, um, thank you f um, for being a great audience and listening. And please, if you could join me in applauding and thanking our amazing uh, panelists. <laughs> Shunoke Abdullahi, Laura Bates, and Paisy Mahmoud. And I'm Winnie Emily, and have a great day, and let's keep on having these conversations.